Uh, but a couple other things just to keep an eye out for. Uh, if you're new to, to Journey and you want to just have a chance to connect with uh, some of our leadership team and some of our, some of our ministry uh, individuals, um, just down the hall right after our service down in the Mission Cold Brew space, we're going to uh, just do kind of a quick meet and greet, uh, be able to connect with you, introduce ourselves if we haven't had a chance to do that yet. Uh, and then in a few weeks on uh, August, I believe it's the 11th, um, Christian, is that the right date? August 11th. Um, we are going to be doing uh, our uh, a, a class called uh, Next Steps. And this is for those of you who want to call Journey Your Home. It's where you can learn a little bit more about us. Uh, and that'll be Sunday, immediately following our service. We'll have pizza there for all of those who register and sign up. And if you want to sign up for that, uh, just mark that down on one of those cards uh, before you drop it into the offering plate or uh, add that to your text message that you send to us to let us know that you want to find out more about getting involved. All right, let's open our Bibles. Uh, we're going to go into our third week uh, of our random scripture verses. We're doing this teaching series called Bible Roulette. Um, it's fun. Uh, it's fun for me. I like a challenge. I really do like a challenge. And, and, and this has been uh, a very exciting challenge for me to take passages chosen completely at random and then learn how to bring them into, uh, in, into this teaching series. But here's what we're basing this series off of. Uh, when you look in, in Scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 uh, and 17, it says this. It says, All of Scripture is inspired by God, and it's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So if we believe this, if we believe that all of scripture is inspired by God and it's useful, then that means that every single verse that we look at, we can understand at some point and learn how to understand how to apply that to our lives. It can become meaningful to us. So that's what we've been doing in this teaching series, and I want to encourage you uh, on this before we see the verse that we're teaching from today. Um, if you do not have a digital Bible, if you don't have one on your, on your smartphone, please download one, put one on there, the YouVersion Bible app, Y-O-U-V-E-R-S-I-O-N, that's how you spell that. That's a good, a good app. The Faith Life Study Bible is one that we use and uh, connects to our projection system here in the church. Um, my wife has been using an app recently called Dwell, which is uh, scripture reading and devotional stuff. So there's a variety of apps that you can get. Make sure you get your hands on one because it will be life-changing and life-transforming. Um, so, here's what we've been doing in this teaching series. We literally take people, we blindfold them, we record them, opening up a Bible at random, slamming their finger down somewhere, and picking a verse, and that is what I teach on. Uh, our media team, they send me the verse that I'm teaching for the upcoming Sunday on Monday morning. So, tomorrow morning, I'll get uh, the verse for, for, for next week. Um, and, uh, and it's been fun doing this because I never know what I'm going to teach uh, until Monday morning. And then I have a week to prepare and to have it ready for everyone here. So it's, it's a challenge. It's a lot of fun. But it's this idea that all of God's word is useful. And we have to believe that. And we have to trust that. And we have to be willing to step out and say, how do I understand this random passage to be something that can be useful and applicable to my life as a believer who's choosing to follow Jesus? So here is the video showing you the selection of our verse. And I'm recording. Guys, it is your epic showdown with Bible Roulette. Who's next? Come on in. Come on down. <laughs> Why, hello there. You ready for this epic showdown of Bible Roulette? Yes. Okay. Got a question for you. Yes. What's your name? Becca. Okay, I got another question for you. Do you know the rules of Bible Roulette? Put this on. 
and then you open the Bible and just put your hand down. And then what? And you take off the blindfold and you read what your finger does. And then what? One, two, Three. <laughs> Bang! Oh, we're going Old Testament. All right. Why don't you read that? Why don't you read where we're at? Right, right here. We are First Chronicles, chapter twenty-two, verse. What verse was it? Two. Yeah, start right now. So David gave orders to call together living in Israel. He assigned them the task of preparing the stone for building the temple of God. Fantastic, good job. Boom, nailed it. Nailed it, all right, closing prayer. I'm kidding. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, Becca. They've been having some fun with this, can you tell? Um, so, here's our verse, First Chronicles. Oop, there we go. There we go, First Chronicles chapter 22, um, verse 2, and it says, So David gave orders to call together the foreigners living in Israel, and he assigned them the task of preparing finished stone for building the temple of God. Um, so there's a lot we can get out of this verse, right? Don't be a foreigner in David's kingdom, or you're going to be forced to work. No, no. There's much more that goes behind this. So let's stop and let's take a look at what has transpired. So First Chronicles, um, when you look at this, it is the life of King David is, is being chronicled, uh, and he is uh, the, the king bringing leadership to the people of Israel. And we see in the first portion of, of First Chronicles, as you go back to, to the very beginning, um, you see some of the descendants of the people of Israel following the priestly line the kingdom of Israel, the kings that, uh, or, or the leaders and those who have brought uh, guidance to the people of Israel. Uh, and then as you come around uh, Chronicles 8, 9, 10, all of that, we start to see the kings of Israel, King Saul, pop into place. In Chronicles chapter, 1 Chronicles 10, King Saul dies. And in chapter 11, David becomes the actual king of Israel. Now, this takes place years after David was actually anointed the king because King Saul did not want to give up the throne. He held on to it for so long and even pursued David trying to take his life because he did not want David to take over the throne that he felt was his. So eventually Saul dies. King David takes over the throne finally and he starts to lead the people of Israel. Israel starts to have some of one of the greatest seasons it had ever seen. Uh, as, you, as you move into verse uh, 15 and 16, the Ark of the Covenant is being moved uh, back to Jerusalem. David sings an incredible song of praise in chapter 16. He dances through the streets rejoicing that the Ark of, uh, of God was now back in its home place where it belongs. And in chapter 17, David decides that he wants to prepare to do something big. He knew that it was prophesied long ago that there would be a great temple built for God. And David says, I'm going to prepare to build it. And God puts the brakes on. David's going, whoa, hang on a second. I want to build this for you. And God says, no, it's not you. David starts to lose a little bit of his steam of passionate leadership after God. And he starts to make several decisions and a few mistakes that all of a sudden become uh, a part of his downfall and really the beginning of his downfall. In chapter 21, this leads the way for what we read in chapter 22, the verse that we just picked up. When you read chapter 21, verse 1, this is what it says, David takes the census. Satan rose up against Israel and caused David to take a census of the people of Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, he said, take a census of all the people of Israel from Beersheba in the south to Dan in the north and bring me a report so I can know how many there are. Down in verse 7, this is what it says, God was very displeased with the census and he punished Israel 
for it. And David said to God, I've, I've sinned greatly by taking this census. Please forgive my guilt for doing this foolish thing. Um, there isn't a rule or a law or something out there that says that a census in and of itself was wrong or sinful or illegal or against God's design. But what comes into play is when you look at chapter 21, verse 1, it says this, Satan rose up against Israel and caused David to take a census of the people of Israel. David allowed influence that was not godly influence into his leadership of God's people. This is what happened. Hang on. We got it? We got it. All right. Technology. This is your side lesson for the day, right? Computers always work right when they're off, okay? That's just, that's a freebie for the day. Um, so David, the census that he took, it's, it's the influence of the census that was wrong and that hurt God's heart. Because ultimately, God knew that what, what, what the mission of the people of Israel was, as God's chosen people, they were called to be light to the darkness. They were called to show the entire world who the God of Israel was. This was their mission. And then anyone who chose to come alongside them and say, I want to follow God, I want to believe him, I want to live for him too, they, they would be able to do this freely without fear of anything. But there was a slow fade that was starting in the life of David where he was allowing influence that wasn't godly to, to influence him and to guide him. See, a slow fade is a dangerous thing. It's a very dangerous thing because often we don't realize what's happened. I don't know if you've noticed, but the lights on the back of the stage, they've gone out. For the last 10 minutes, they have been fading down slowly. We programmed our system to do this. And you didn't realize it, and you didn't notice it, but now the lights are gone. ADL, why don't you bring it up and show everyone what it was right before we started here. This is what it looked like in the beginning of the teaching. But for the last 10 minutes, some of you haven't noticed and haven't realized that the lights have been fading down. Because I want to drive home this point that there's, there's a fade that can happen in our lives and in our relationships and it's a series of small, foolish steps that we make that eventually lead to a great downfall. And this is what happens with David. It starts with the census, and then chapter 22, verse 2 comes in, and it says, David gave orders to call together the foreigners living in Israel. He took the census that was influenced by Satan he, he accomplished the census. Then we see, actually, as you read further in, in, in verse 21, the judgment for David's sin comes on the people of Israel. David apologizes, builds an altar, repents before God, but then he takes the information that was gathered under the influence of Satan, and he brings that into his leadership, and he says, now take the information we have. All the foreigners that are here, we've got enough people to do a ton of work, so let's get them to come and be the ones that do this labor. Let's let the Israelites, the people of Israel, let's let them just relax a little bit. Because what happened to the people of Israel pre pre previously? They were captured by the Egyptians. They were, they, they were enslaved by the Egyptians for 400 years and they were forced into hard labor for the Egyptians. And David's seeing this and he's going, listen, we're, we're, we're not going to do this work. We've already done enough work in our, in our time. We've, we've had it brought against us. Let's let others do the work, the work that honors the God of our people. And there's a slow fade in the decision-making process. He's allowed influence that is ungodly and unwise to start to guide his decisions. You see, in our marriages, it's, it, it normally it's not something that happens immediately that leads to an affair. It's a slow fade, a slow series of decisions. We need to beware of the slow fade inside our life. 
Be very, uh, be very alert. Keep yourself on guard. Scripture tells us this over and over and over again. Beware of the slow fade that can happen. See, in marriages, it can be a small fight that grows bigger and bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden it causes distance and it causes us to refuse to want to, re- to, 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 want to swallow our pride and resolve the issue. And then that lingers on and it carries on and we start to get even more frustrated and we make small decisions that continue to offend each other. And there's that slow fade that eventually drives a couple apart, eventually leads to either a, a, a an affair which then really escalates uh, a split between the couple or it leads to just this slow degradation of a relationship that once was beautiful and wonderful. See, it's a slow fade that often leads us to places of financial insecurity and bankruptcy. Normally, it's not just a big sweeping decision that happens that causes this so much inside our, our, our country and our, our society. It's the small decisions. It's not having good financial literacy and creating a budget and learning, this is what I need to do in order to make ends meet. And then we live beyond our means. And sometimes it's a combination of we just don't have good enough work ethic and all of those things all together that, that, that cause a slow progression of bankruptcy and financial insolvency inside our lives. These things happen slowly. It's a slow fade, just like we saw on the, on the lights. You didn't even notice it. And before you knew it, all of a sudden, someone br- I bring your attention to it, and you go, wait, yeah, it is dark up there. David was experiencing this as he's preparing for the temple that he's not even commissioned to build. God had told him, no, 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 this isn't your job. This isn't your responsibility. You see, when you go down in verse 6, chapter 22, verse 6, it says this, David sent for his son Solomon and instructed him to build the temple of the, of the Lord, uh, the God of Israel. He said, my son, I wanted, to build the, uh, I wanted to build a temple to honor the name of the Lord my God. But the Lord said to me, you've killed many men in the battles that you have fought. And since you have shed so much blood in my sight, you will not be the one to build a temple to honor my name. But you will have a son who will be a man of peace. I will give him peace with his enemies and all the surrounding lands. And his name will be Solomon. I will give him peace to quiet Israel during his reign. He is the one who will build my temple to honor my name. He will be my son, and I will be his father, and I will secure the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. David knows he's not the one to do this, yet he still takes this information provided to him by unwise uh, counsel. He takes the information he gathered in this census, And he pulls together people, basically abuses the foreigners that had come into Israel wanting to live and be in Israel because they're recognizing the God of Israel is the true God and they're there for the right reasons, but David uses the information he gathered for the wrong reasons. And this is really the start of of, of his downfall as a king. His slow fade as a great king of Israel, it starts with the census. And slowly we start to see his family fall apart. In fact, his kids, they rise up against each other. There's a lot of infighting that takes place. They're killing each other. They're raping each other. They're trying to seize the throne from him. It's messed up. It's a Jerry Springer show right there in the kingdom of of David. This is what's happening. And the end of his life, when he gets ready to crown Solomon as king, what's actually happening is one of his other sons has already tried to say, hey, I'm the new king of Israel. And that's why David kind of fast tracks everything. He goes, you're not the king of Israel until you've done a certain number of things. And one is you've got to ride my donkey down a certain street and the priest has to anoint you, right? And so he quickly, as quick as possible, gets Solomon on that donkey, gets him ridden down the street, gets him down to the temple and has the priest anoint him and proclaim him as the new king of Israel. This is what happens in David's family because of the slow fade, because he became unfocused. I want to read a few scriptures. Uh, Psalm chapter 1, 
verse 1, this is what it says. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. You see, we need to have focus. If we want to stay on track, if we want to make sure that we're going God's direction and that we have God's blessing and God's favor on us, then we have to stay focused. Anyone here have ADD or ADHD? Anyone here just want to be part of the club, right? It's challenging. I'll tell you, I, I, was, uh, I was diagnosed with ADHD as an adult, and uh, I was telling my mother after, after the, the doctor's appointment and all of the things and the diagnosis came out, and I was like, so they, they, they confirmed that I have ADHD. They did a whole series of tests and all this stuff, and my mom goes, you know, I kind of knew there was something wrong with you, you know, in, in a loving, sweet Southern way, you know, and, uh, you know, she, she, she knew that there was something a little bit unique about the way that my focus was never there. And it's a challenge. And as a guy who deals with this, I have to constantly discipline myself and remind myself, stay focused, stay focused, stay focused, stay focused, squirrel. Right? And it's, it's, such, it's such a challenge. But we do the same thing with our faith. We have to do the same thing. Stay focused, stay focused, stay focused, stay focused. I'll tell you, one of the greatest blessings in my life, but it agitates me like there's no tomorrow, is my wife when she says, Mike, are you focused, right? It's great, but it can cause some of those, you know, a little bit of uh, friction in, in, in the marriage. But I know that her heart is to help me. I know that her heart is to keep me on point. See, we must, in our faith, stay focused Remain on point. Keep our eyes on the things that matter most. This is what Colossians 3, 2 says. It says, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Set your eyes on the things above is what some translations tell us. Put your eyes on the things above. When you have horses that go into a race, I grew up in, uh, uh, in the Saratoga area and uh, in Saratoga, New York, and they've got the race tracks, the horse tracks up there. And you see as they get the horses all lined up on the start lines, they have blinders on them because the goal is we want the horse to see down the track and see what's in front of them, not see the other horses to the side that may only be inches away and distract them and cause them to get unfocused. So they have blinders on the horses. We need to walk with blinders in our faith that keep our eyes on the things above, not the things that are all around us and the things of this world. It's so easy for us to get distracted, but the, what we need to do is we need to focus. This is what 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. Sounds to me like Peter, when he's writing this, he's thinking of people like David who didn't watch out for the devil, who kind of tempted him and led him into taking this census and arming his leadership with information that really wasn't important. He says, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Lions don't look for prey that are alert. You ever think about that? They're looking for prey that are injured, that are wounded, that are unfocused and distracted because they're the easy ones to take down. You can go on YouTube and see videos of little kids sitting in front of these lion pens in, at a zoo where they've got the big glass wall and a little kid with his back up against the glass and a lion slowly comes crouching through the grass and all of a sudden pounces at the glass with that little kid's back facing him. Because they want the ones that aren't watching, the ones that aren't looking, the ones that aren't aware. This is, this is what, what, what Satan is being compared to. He prowls around like a lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him. Be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. If you've ever thought, I'm alone, I must be the only one dealing with this, you're wrong. 
You're not the only one who deals with the temptations that you face. You're not the only one who deals with the conflict that you do inside your relationships and, and inside your families. You're not the only one. Believers all over the world are battling this. And some of us, we need someone to tap us on the shoulder and say, hey, are you focused? Are you focused? How do you stay focused? You keep your eyes on the things that are of God and you, re- you, you allow yourself to be held accountable by others around you. Do you have people who are willing and, uh, uh, to actually have those hard conversations with you? Do you have people inside your life that are going to hold you accountable, that are going to challenge you, that are going to be real and honest with you, that are going to ask you the hard questions? Do you have those people in your life? Because if you do, I, I, I'm, I'm happy for you. Hold on to those relationships. Value those relationships. Because your cheerleaders are sometimes going to cheerlead you right off the edge of a cliff. They, they Really, you need the people that are going to tell you, no, no, pump the brakes. Hang on. Slow down there, bucko. You're, you know, getting a little wild. You've got to have those friends. Let's keep on reading uh, through Scripture here. Psalm chapter 1. Verses 1 through 3, I want to finish reading this passage. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all that they do. What happens when you stay focused and you do exactly what you're supposed to do, you become something that stands strong, that does not change, that is immovable. When we set our eyes on God and we keep focused on him and we make sure he is the priority of our life and his values are the priority of our life and we have others that help keep us focused and help us keep our eyes on the things that, 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 that are holy and the things that, that need to be, uh, that, that we need to just to, to let go. You, you've got to let that stuff go. Last week, we, we, I, I taught this idea that, that, that you had these cattle they were hooked up to a cart because of the curse that came over the, the, the Philistines when they had the Ark of the Covenant inside their possession. And they said, we got to get rid of this thing. And they hooked up two cattle and they said, wherever it goes, it goes. Let's just get this thing out of here. And the cattle had the temptation of hearing their, the, their own little calves off in a barn. They had the temptation of hearing their calves off in a barn and they could have veered that direction. But instead, they went straight to where God had intended them to go. Some of us in our lives, we have these distractions that are pulling at our attention. And it's going to take honest people that are going to hold us accountable and say, get rid of this out of your life. It's unnecessary. If you want to stay focused and you want God's favor and his blessing on your life, then you need to get your eyes on the right things. just want to keep reading a few things here. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 to 20, uh, I think I'm going to 26 or 27 here. It says, my child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart, for they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. Guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life avoid all perverse talk stay away from corrupt speech look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you mark out a straight path for your feet stay on the safe path don't get sidetracked keep your feet from following evil Most of Proverbs is written by Solomon. Here you have instructions being given to a son. Instructions written to a son that just gives this advice of stay focused, stay on track, keep your eyes forward. Keep your eyes on the things of God, not the things that will allow you to follow the path of evil. 
Sounds like wisdom from someone who, ha- who may possibly have learned the hard way. When you get distracted, you get burned. When you allow yourself to get unfocused, you get burned. You see, as we spend time in this teaching series, one of the things that keeps coming back to us is this idea of wisdom, wise ways, pursuing the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of self, keeping your eyes focused on the things that God has for you, on the path that he has for you. This is just a recurring theme coming back over and over again. And when you stop and when you look at the, at the base verse that we're using for this whole series, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Scripture leads us to the wisdom of God. We can either walk in the wisdom of God and experience God's favor and God's blessing on our lives, or we can walk in our own ways and slowly fade out of God's hand of blessing and God's protection and God's guidance and God's favor. That doesn't mean he loves you or I any less. It just means that you are no longer walking with his blessing on you, which is a scary place to be, and it's a place where you start to feel alone. As you look at what David starts to write as, uh, as, as his family is falling apart in the Psalms, you can read him, uh, or you can read where he says things like, why have you abandoned me? God, where are you? And I guarantee you, God is sitting there in heaven going, David, I'm here. I'm the same place I've always been. You're the one that's moved. You're the one who's pursued your own way. You're the one who stepped off the path. I've given you all the wisdom that you need. I've, you spent so much time with me as a child out in the fields playing that harp and singing worship songs to me and glorifying me. Go back and read your own writings. David recorded so many songs and wrote so many great things about God, but then towards the end of his life, there was this slow fade And it started with decisions like this, allowing Satan to rise up against Israel and to guide him to call for a census. And then he makes this decision to call together all the foreigners. We're going to put them all to work. We're going to make them do the work that we, the people of Israel, should take joy in doing, that is building a temple to honor the God who saves us. We should take joy in that. And as members of the modern church, members of the church today here in our culture, we need to take joy in saying, I have the opportunity to be a part of God's great plan of redemption in the lives of other people. And I'm willing to do whatever it's going to take to make that happen. I'm ready to make the sacrifices in my own life. I'm ready to give like I've never given before so that the funds are there to be able to do incredible things so we can send missionaries all over the world to be able to share the gospel. I'm ready to put in the sweat equity myself to build the, 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 the church so that God can be glorified. That's what we need to be passionate about. We can't hope and pray that someone else is going to do the work for us. David was hoping that someone else would put the backbreaking work into smoothing these stones and preparing them for the temple when it should have been the people of Israel. And today I want to challenge you. Are you hoping that someone else is going to do the hard work for the gospel? Or are you willing to do it yourself? It's not easy. But I'll tell you, when we're focused, and when we're doing God's work, and when we keep our eyes on him, and we pursue godly counsel, and we pursue godly ways in our life, And we say, Lord, whatever it takes, I want to see you glorified. I'm willing to put my everything into it. His blessing and his favor and his protection is on you. That means you will have peace as you go through the storms. That means that when that time comes, you know, it feels like like you're, you're sitting in a boat and like Jesus is out there in the water and he's saying, hey, take a step. Come walk, and you're going, um, no thanks, I'm good, I'm cozy, 
And he keeps going, trust me, this is going to be amazing. And you go, okay. Nope, not doing it, right? We want to do that when God calls us to a place of faith, when he calls us to step out of what's comfort. We want to say no, we want to hold back, but God's saying, man, step out on the water Live in a place of real faith for the glory and the honor of God because he will be the one that catches us when we feel like we're starting to sink and fall. But the only, the only way we're ever going to be there is if we're focused, if, we're, if our eyes are on him, if our eyes are on God, if we're pursuing him, if we're praying, him, or praying to him, if we're knowing this word, are you reading this word and seeing the lessons of others who have gone before us? And seeing how they reacted in situations and seeing what was the circumstances and the outcome and the results and and God's blessing and God's favor versus God's curse and God's hand of blessing taken off of them. If you read this, you see it and all of a sudden you realize this isn't just a nice cutesy little storybook that we read to our kids. This is something that is real, real life, a real God interacting with real people who've experienced the same kind of stuff that I'm experiencing. We can't put our faith and the glorification of our God on the back of someone else, we've got to do it ourselves. Be focused. Stay true. Stay true to the word of God and the ways of God, and he will do great things with you. I pray for God's blessing and God's guidance on my kids every single night because I want to see them be able to do greater things than I or, or my wife will ever be able to do for the glory of God. But the only way they'll be able to do that is if I stay focused and I teach them how to focus and I teach them how to do what is necessary to see God's name glorified and that we don't try to outsource it to someone else. Are you outsourcing your faith today? And I ask that in this sense. Are you spending more time listening to others teach God's word than you are spending in God's word itself? Are you listening to more pastors and preachers than you are reading God's word for yourself? If you are, then you're potentially outsourcing your faith. Someone else has chewed it up and then regurgitated it for you from what they took out of it. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's beneficial, sometimes that's helpful, but you've gotta be in God's word. Are you spending more time thinking about praying than you are praying? Because I know a lot of us, we we might be there, right? Man, I I probably should have prayed about this before I stepped into this interview. Man, I probably should have prayed about this before I made this big decision in my life. Man, I, I really wish I'd had time to pray today, right? We spend time thinking about that instead of just taking that moment saying, God, I'm sorry that I, I didn't put you first in my day. Help me to do better tomorrow. But instead, we just live in a place of regret instead of a place of action. Are we outsourcing our faith? Because when we do that, we get unfocused. Make God first. Make him the center of everything you do. Live wisely so that you avoid the slow fade. See, the lights didn't dim yet, right? Some of you are still waiting. Are they they gonna dim again? Yeah, no, they're not. No. It's a slow fade that we can move, move from a place of God's favor and God's blessing to a place of being alone and feeling abandoned. But I'll tell you this. You can get back into God's favor and God's blessing very quick. And that takes repentance. Just an honest, repentant heart that says, God, I'm sorry. I know there may be consequences for my actions and my decisions, but I'm sorry. I want to live for you. I want to to do this again. I want to correct this. I want to change my ways. I want to get back into that good spot of godly wisdom and godly favor on my life. For some of us, we're experiencing a slow fade, maybe not spiritually, but in various places, various areas of our life, whether it's our, in our marriages and our finances, um, in our reliance on substances and uh, drunkenness or, 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 or various addictions that we have going on. Maybe there are slow fades that are taking place inside our workplace. 
you all know that the new guy at work is always the happy guy, right? And everyone else who's been there for 20 years, they're all miserable and like, oh, don't worry, you'll lose your joy one day, right? That's, that's how everyone who's been there forever responds. Some of us, we're, we're, we're in that grumpy spot in our workplace and we're forgetting that we can be a joy and we can impact the lives of other people for the glory of God no matter what we're doing in life. And some of you, you need to get that joy back. You need to get back to a place of owning the responsibility that you accepted to be an employee for your employer. And you need to do that with joy. There's, we, we have these slow fades that can happen everywhere in our life, from our parenting to, I mean, just, just every facet of our life. And I want to challenge you today, pursue God's glory in every single thing that you do. Stay focused on him and his favor will be on you no matter what is in front of you. David, this was the start of a slow fade for his kingdom. And it's sad to see what happened in the infighting that was taking place and the sadness that he passed away from this life with looking at what had happened to this great kingdom that he built on, on, you know, with God's favor. I pray that that doesn't happen for each of us. I'm going to ask our worship team to come on up. We're going to spend time worshiping. We're going to respond by uh, taking some time and and sharing in communion. Um, Our ushers are going to prepare to come to uh, give out the communion elements as well. Jesus, in his final supper with the disciples, he sits down with them and he says, listen, I'm going to take this bread, I'm going to break it, and it's something I want you to do often to remember me. He takes this cup of wine and he shares it to, uh, to his disciples and he says, here, take a drink of this. This is like my blood, which is gonna be shed for you. It's going to be spilled for you. And he tells his disciples, I want you guys to do this often in remembrance of what I have done for you. And communion is something that we share in every single week to try and remember, to help us just keep our eyes focused on what God has done for us We've been rescued from the curse of our sin because Jesus died on a cross. He allowed himself, a sinless man, a perfect man, to to, to be killed. He was a spotless lamb, as scripture describes it. The final sacrifice to be able to make restitution between God and man, sinful man, and a holy and pure God. And if you put your faith and you put your trust in Jesus today, he he tells you, I want you to remember what I have done. And if you have not put your faith in God yet, I want to give you this chance, give you this opportunity to say, God, I want to live for you. I see that your way is the best way that I could ever pursue. Help me to live in your favor, God. Help me to live in your ways. Help me to see that Jesus truly is the one and final sacrifice to unite me with you. It's all it is. It's not a little magic prayer that we say. It's just recognizing what Jesus has done for us. And I want to encourage you just to take, take a moment. If, if you've never uh, recognized this and it, admitted this and come before God and said, God, I want to make you the head of my life, the king of my life, the king of my heart. If you've never said that to him, just take a moment and let him know. Our ushers, they're going to start handing out these, uh, the, the juice and the bread. There's two cups stacked on top of each other. The bottom cup has the bread, top cup has the juice. Just hold on to it while we sing this song. We'll get together in the middle of the song and we'll share in community together. We'll all take, uh, it, we'll, we'll all drink the, the juice and eat the bread together in just a minute. Uh, but we're gonna start worshiping. And uh, as the uh, communion plate uh, passes, just pull one of those cups out. So let's stand and let's worship uh, during this, this moment that we have. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my soul. Let the king of my heart be the shadow. 